Please turn uh, in your hymnals to the back to page 83. We've gone over this before in the sermons on the Belgic Confession, but I, I wanted to uh, give our attention to a, a particular puzzling line found in this article. You turn to page 83 to article 28. Again, the familiar topic of the church. <clears throat> Everyone is bound to join himself to the true church. Let's read this together for our edification. We believe since the holy congregation is an assembly of those who are saved, and outside of it there is no salvation, that no person of whatsoever state or condition he may be ought to withdraw from it, content to be by himself, but that all men are in duty bound to join and unite themselves with it, maintaining the unity of the church, submitting themselves to the doctrine and discipline thereof, bowing their necks under the yoke of Jesus Christ, and as mutual members of the same body, serving to the edification of the brethren according to the talents God has given them. And that this may be the more effectually observed, it is the duty of all believers, according to the word of God, to separate themselves from all those who do not belong to the church, and to join themselves to this congregation, wheresoever God has established it, even though the magistrates and edicts of princes were against it, yea, though they should suffer death or any other corporal punishment. Therefore, all those who separate themselves from the same or do not join themselves to it act contrary to the ordinance of God. Now, the puzzling phrase that we'll be focusing on today is where it says, regarding the true church, that outside of it, there is no salvation. And consequently, the end, that therefore all those who separate themselves from the same or do not join themselves to it act contrary to the ordinance of God. Uh, that is particularly puzzling to most Protestants for the Belgic Confession to say that out of it there is no salvation. And that will be considered uh, today uh, in the sermon. But first, if you would turn to Hebrews chapter 10. And what a wonderful chapter this 10th chapter of Hebrews is. Just full of much rich cuisine. But uh, we're going to go through the chapter like you might want to go through a buffet to Take a little of everything rather than a lot of something. <laughs> Hebrews 10. Since the law has but a shadow of the good things to come instead of the true form of these realities, it can never, by the same sacrifices that are continually offered every year, make perfect those who draw near. Otherwise, would they not have ceased to be offered? Since the worshipers, having once been cleansed, would no longer have any consciousness of sins. But in these sacrifices, there's a reminder of sins every year. For it's impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. Consequently, when Christ came into the world, he said, Sacrifices and offerings you have not desired, but a body have you prepared for me. In burnt offerings and sin offerings you have taken no pleasure. Then I said, Behold, I have come to do your will, O God, as it is written of me in the scroll of the book. When he said above, You have neither desired nor taken pleasure in sacrifices and offerings and burnt offerings and sin offerings. These are offered according to the law. Then he added, Behold, I have come to do your will. He does away with the first in order to establish the second. And by that will, we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. And every priest stands daily at his service, offering repeatedly the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. 
But when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God, waiting from that time until his enemies should be made a footstool for his feet. For by a single offering, he has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. And the Holy Spirit also bears witness to us. For after saying, this is the covenant thou make with them, uh, after those days declares the Lord, I will put my laws in their hearts and write them on their minds. Then he adds, I will remember their sins and their lawless deeds no more. Where there is forgiveness of these, there is no longer any offering for sin. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and the living way that he opened up for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh, and since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. For if we go on sinning deliberately after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins but a fearful expectation of judgment and a fury of fire that will consume the adversaries. Anyone who has set aside the law of Moses dies without mercy on the evidence of two or three witnesses. How much more punishment do you think? Reserved by the one who's trampled underfoot the Son of God has profaned the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified and has outraged the spirit of grace. For we know him, him who said, Vengeance is mine, I will repay. And again, the Lord will judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. But recall the former days when after you were enlightened, you, you endured a hard struggle with sufferings, sometimes being publicly exposed to reproach and affliction, sometimes being partners with those so treated. But you had compassion on those in prison. And you joyfully accepted the plundering of your property, since you knew that you yourselves had a better possession and an abiding one. Therefore, do not throw away your confidence, which has a great reward. For you have need of endurance, so that when you've done the will of God, you may receive what is promised. For yet a little while, and the coming one will come and will not delay. But my righteous one shall live by faith. And if he shrinks back, my soul has no pleasure in him. But we are not of those who shrink back and are destroyed, but of those who have faith and preserve their souls. May God bless the reading of his word in your hearing this morning. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we do pray for thy Holy Spirit to bring home to us thy word, to cause us to live, to build up our faith, and grant us, Lord, we pray, in so believing it, we may indeed, again, know the power of Christ's cross and the wonder of standing in the holy place because of our high priest, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. So we have this puzzling statement in the Belgic Confession. But this puzzling statement was commonplace in the 16th and 17th century amongst our Protestant forebears. Uh, this, uh, this was not a, some type of a residual from uh, the Roman Catholic mentality. This is a very thoughtful expression. We find the Belgic Confession, for example, as we've seen, saying that there's no salvation apart from the true church, the visible church. And all who withdraw from it or do not join it act contrary to God's ordinance. The Westminster Confession, written uh, 80 years or so later than the Belgian Confession, speaks in the same manner regarding the visible church, out of which there's no ordinary possibility of salvation. 
preceding both the both these confessions is John Calvin's words in the Institutes of the Christian Religion. Listen to what Calvin says in a number of different places. He says, away from her bosom, one cannot hope for any forgiveness of sins or any salvation. Again, Calvin says later, it's disastrous to leave the church. Then Calvin goes on to say, for the Lord esteems the communion of his church so highly that he counts as a traitor and apostate from Christianity anyone who arrogantly leaves any Christian society, provided it cherishes the true ministry of word and sacrament. Calvin's giving you a little door there. The church has fallen away from a proper administration of word and sacrament. Do leave. <laughs> but insofar that it's properly being administered, to leave it is disastrous. If you have no expectation of any genuine claims to Christianity at all. This was common 16th and century reform thought. They were united on this. You don't see one, you don't find anyone uttering or suggesting anything to the contrary. And yet to our ears here in the 21st centuries, that's odd. <laughs> that doesn't make sense. You know, I heard that going to church does not make you a Christian. That's what I've always been told. I agree with that. Going to church does not make you a Christian. <laughs> but not going to church constitutes and proves that you're not a Christian. <laughs> so <laughs> remember, it's not a simple coin that has the same message on both sides. You see, the, the point is, is, what is it that Christians do? If you believe in Jesus, if you're trusting his gospel, if you're looking to him to save you and him alone, you've received his love into your heart. The Holy Spirit has placed that love for Christ in your heart, and that is reciprocated. You're just not a vessel. Okay, I believe in Jesus, I received his love, now I'm walking about with it. It's a, it's a, it's a reciprocated love for Christ. And... The reformers understood the very thing the Bible had taught, that that love is reciprocated by loving him and loving his people and especially loving his worship with his people where the two are combined together. Christ himself said, I've come to build my church. And the believing heart says, yes, Lord. Let me participate. Let me not detract or deter or destroy what it is you're seeking to build, but to be useful to you in its construct. So if you're saved, you will love your Savior. And that love issues in the worship of your Savior with his people, where the word and the sacraments are rightly celebrated and those who withdraw those who refuse it are evidencing anti-christianity they're not evidencing pro-christianity they are as the belgic confession so rightly says they are resistant to the ordinance of god well, we see it in our creeds. I mean, you can see, we can hear it in the voices of the reformers who were serious students of the Word of God. But is it biblical? Is this a biblically sustainable idea? Or indeed, at the end of the day, it is indeed residual historical leftovers from the Catholic Church. Well, let's look at it first of all. Let's quickly just think. For John chapter 4. Jesus meeting the Samaritan woman at the well. Jesus there at the well with the Samaritan woman in his conversation links together the gift of the waters of life, which he offers to her, with worship. Jesus links the two together. Water and worship are linked together. To drink of the waters of eternal life is part and parcelly 
found in the context of the Father's worship. So that's what he told the woman at the well. The Father is seeking worshipers to come and worship him in spirit and truth. For it is in worship that we drink in the grace of God that is offered to us, comes to us through the means of grace. Grace doesn't just kind of pop out of the sky anywhere. The grace comes to us through the means of grace. That is, through the word and sacraments. It's Jesus Christ himself in Ephesians 4 who raises up those who can teach and preach the word as a means of grace for the benefit and growth of God's people. And so Jesus himself links together the waters of eternal life with the worship of the Father in heaven. And this consequently, if you have no thirst for the means of grace, and you're content to be by yourself alone, and content to ignore the means of grace as they're publicly offered to the corporate assembly, and you're not thirsting for Christ, because he is administers the waters of refreshment through the means of grace. That's John 4. Now Hebrews 10. Look at Hebrews 10. Just to do a little overview here of this chapter. Uh, First of all, the author speaks of the cross of Christ. Fulfilling the Old Testament sacrificial system. A once and for all sacrifice. Ratifying the new covenant. And then out of that, benefits are extended to those who come to Christ and his cross. Two of them, the forgiveness of sins and the renewal of the heart, both taken from Jeremiah that the author quotes. And then out of this renewed heart, this different heart, this spiritual, living, heavenly heart, and having forgiveness of sins, Hebrews 10 doesn't stop there. Okay, you got a new heart, you got forgiveness, you're good to go. It, no, it, it doesn't stop. The author continues to explain what? Now, in light of this, you have access to what? Heaven, where your high priest Christ is, to commune with him through his flesh and blood. And in that communion with Jesus Christ in his flesh and blood that you now have access to through the gospel, it is an assembly that meets there. And thus the author of the Hebrews warns, don't forsake your assembling. You're assembling as you assemble together to enter and enjoy the heavenly arena. But rather, uh, what? Draw near. Draw near. Old Testament terminology drawn straight from the sacrificial system that we draw near through the sacrifices to God. So now in Christ we draw near through his sacrifice in worship just as they did in the old. So now we do in the new. But our drawing near is not horizontal, an earthly temple. It is vertical to the fulfillment of it. And we draw near while the day is drawing near. So there's the whole picture in Hebrews 10. Uh, We're drawing near to the heavenly arena as that day is drawing near, closing in upon us. For that heavenly arena that we enter by faith, invisibly, will be visibly entered. And there will be a division of the race itself, of course, between those who know Christ and those who don't. In the simplest of terms, we find here in Hebrews chapter 10 what I call the golden chain of worship. Uh, You've heard of the golden chain of Romans chapter 8, 28 through 30. Well, here's the golden chain of worship, the very steps of worship leading up into the heavenly arena with its expectation in eternity. What's the point? Well, the point is the gospel brings people to heaven. That's what it does. The gospel brings people to heaven. 
And that heavenly place is the setting of corporate worship. What is heaven? It is the, the all-time complete gathering of the people of God in worship when Christ returns. And now it peers in upon us in our corporate earthly assembly. We see in this text, Hebrews 10, this great transition from old to new. Old covenant to new covenant. It's awesome. Find that Christ, once and for all, there's the contrast to the old. What's the contrast? Well, in the Old Testament, they're constantly offering animal sacrifices. Okay, what was the problem with the old covenant? The people could sin faster than the priests could make sacrifice. Plus, there is an ineffectuality with regard to animal blood. But Christ came, not repeatedly, but once. Not for an extended period, but for all time, in contrast to the Old Testament. Offered himself as a sacrifice for our sin. Really and truly dealing with what? The issue. You know, it's like when you're in a conversation with your spouse or with somebody else, and it's, everything's all around here and all over the map, and finally you stop and you say, can we deal with what? The issue. Can we stop all this and nail this? Oh, okay. Well, that's what Christ did. He dealt with the issue of our estrangement from God. The issue of why we're not in heaven now and why we're not going to heaven in the world to come. It's our sin. Christ dealt with it once and for all. And that definitive dealing with our sin, look at chapter 10, verse 9, how it puts it so definitively. Behold, I've come to do your will. He does away with the first in order to establish the second. The old covenant is abolished and its sacrifices done away with. To what? To establish the second, the new covenant that it anticipated. The old anticipated the new. Those sacrifices look forward to Christ. They're not just merely replaced by Christ. But we must understand the definitive nature of Hebrews chapter 10. No more animal sacrifices with the coming of Christ because the old covenant is abolished. It is annulled. It is over. We have popular theologies today that says in the coming future millennium, there's going to be the what? The re-inauguration of animal sacrifices. How does that stack up to the book of Hebrews? It's in flat contradiction. It's a redemptive historical going backward rather than forward. If our theology at the end of the day lands with a clear, obvious contradiction to a very fundamentally spelled out biblical truth, what should go on in our minds? There's something defective about our theology. He abolished the old, will not return. And he established. Is that what that word means? Established. The new. Christ has accomplished it in history once and for all. And what Christ has accomplished in the transition from old covenant to new covenant is now applied to you and to me. If what Christ has accomplished has not yet been applied to you, you it's not yet been applied so that now is yours, you're still not a Christian. It must be applied. Well, what is applied? 
<laughs> the benefits of the new covenant that Christ has accomplished. And what are those benefits? He tells us right here. Quoting from Jeremiah, as Jeremiah looks forward to the new covenant. Jeremiah the weeping prophet. Jeremiah had no good news for the people of God back then. You're out. God's wrath is coming. Pack your bags. But he could look to the future and say, a new covenant. A new covenant that brings two enormous blessings. A new heart that is not rebellious toward God and his law, but a new heart that loves God's law and has the power to keep it. Ezekiel 36 saw the same thing. Ezekiel spells out a little differently. It says, God will take out your heart of stone and put in a heart of flesh and cause you to walk in its statutes. <laughs> yes, you must intentionally pursue sanctification in your life, but at the end of the day, you must be able to say, it's only the grace of God at work in me. That's the new covenant. Benefit number one, a new heart. But the other, the one he was getting at, the one where the author to the Hebrews is trying to get to is that second great benefit. The forgiveness of sins. To forgive their lawless deeds. Christ has secured a real forgiveness. Those animal sacrifices could never do that. Those animal sacrifices could never satisfy the justice of God. But Christ has. He's laid it to rest that we might receive the benefit of his payment for our sin, his curse bearing for our sin by way of forgiveness. Praise God for that wonderful gift. That is Christ's cross applied to you and to me, received by faith. And that's why the author of the Hebrews, you know, he, he periodically kind of warns, now make sure and once you hear all this, you just don't sit there like a bump in the lawn and go, boy, that sure is nice. But make sure what? That you have received it, that you believe it, that it is yours, that you possess it. What Christ has done in the past, its benefits are offered to us in the present to be applied. But it also has something awaiting for the future that's part of it. That new heart, that new heart, that heart of heaven, that resurrection heart that is invisible is going to become visible in the future. So that which Christ has accomplished and has applied, Hebrews says, is also awaiting us. The heaven that we now enter by faith is awaiting us when Christ comes back in his visible power. And thus, draw near. Draw near, he says, to heaven. Draw near to heaven while you live here on earth in the context of the church's corporate assembly. Because that's what the gospel leads us to. That's what the gospel brings us to. The gospel doesn't bring us, I got a new heart, got forgiveness of sins, got here is forgiveness of sins, here's my new heart, got them in my back pocket, they're in my wallet, okay, I'm off. And you wander around doing your own thing for Jesus. Now we must follow what scripture says. Christ welcomes us as his covenant community into heaven because we have complied with the terms of the gospel and we have received its application to us, thus bringing us, drawing us into the conclusion and the goal of the gospel, entrance into heaven, even while on earth, entrance in the church's corporate worship. And that's what we have in corporate worship, brothers and sisters. What does the author to the Hebrews get to here? That being able to enter heaven while we're still on earth as, is a foretaste. It's a beginning. Paul says it's a first fruits or a down payment. That's Paul's language in his epistles in Ephesians 1 and 
2 Corinthians 5 and 2 Corinthians 1. First fruits, more to come. Got an apple and a pear? Well, guess what? There's a whole huge orchard coming of apples and pears. <laughs> you got your hundred bucks? Your down payment? Well, guess what? There's billions on its way. And you've got the beginning now. You see, the whole point is this. If you don't have the beginning, you don't have the ending either. And if you got the beginning, you can anticipate the ending. And where is the beginning at? It's in the corporate worship of God's church. Where God's people corporately together, through the gospel, enter heaven for a little while, knowing there's far, 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 far more to come. See, the gospel opens heaven to us. And if we've not entered into heaven through the gospel, we will not enter into heaven. See, that's the point of the reformers that's the point of of hebrews here as we look forward to the coming day this day that's on its way this day of severity yet also this day of welcome into the new creation the reformers got it the reformers understood that the church as the corporate assembly of God's new covenant community to attend to the means of grace and enter the heavenly arena through Jesus Christ was a biblical conception, not just a mere leftover of Roman Catholic spiritual tyranny. If you are headed Toward heaven, brothers and sisters, because you believe in Jesus. If you love Jesus Christ because he is what heaven is all about, the consummation of covenant union and communion with him, then you will begin drinking here ahead of time in the public worship of God's new covenant community that Jesus Christ, that he is building in this world. You might say to me, is is this as good as it gets? Is this as good as it gets? Yes, this is as good as it gets. Now the Spirit of God may enrich some of you more deeply, more consciously, more fully than others. But this is where it happens. This is where you get the goods, if the goods are being given. And if the goods aren't being given, what was Calvin implying? Get out where they can be given. But to leave the church where Jesus Christ is offered in the means of grace is disastrous. It is destruction. For that is where Christ and his gospel brings you to his people in the heavenly arena. Now, and oh boy, in the world to come. That's our hope. That's our anticipation. That's the sure hope for the people of God. Let us pray.